Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, creator of everything, we just thank you for, you know, the, the spring days that we've had. We thank you for the, the joy that that brings to, to our hearts. We're, we're thankful that we can bring before you um, all of our hurts and weaknesses and lay them before your cross that you can that you work with us to lift us up and when we're despaired when we're frightened when we're nervous when we're at our end Lord we we thank you that you let us worship you that that it is pleasing to your ears for your children to to worship you and and pray to you and we just thank you we ask that today you would work in our hearts in our minds help us to understand and to know what it is that you have for us today and I just pray for each aspect of the service that you would have your will with over it. We pray this in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. So first, our scripture reading is uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 13. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whatever in the deepest depths or the highest of heights. But Ahaz said, I will not, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you try, will you try the patience of God also? And then we switch over to John 10, verses 22 through 26. Then came the Feast of de Dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and as Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade, the Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The miracles I did in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. May the Lord have a blessing on his word today. Amen. Good morning, one all. Good morning. Good to be back two weeks in a row. Thank you for your prayer. Feeling better, not completely better, but a lot better. Two nights in a row with no coughing, six less than that. Yeah. So after a month of not taking clear nights, you kind of realize you took that for granted. So, But should I start coughing in the midst of my sermon, don't panic. I will turn purple. You'll think you'll think my vein is going to burst, and, and but I will be fine. I've got my inhaler. I've got a cough drop. We've got some water to drink right now. So just wait it out. His name was Flint. He was a poor Scottish farmer. I probably turned it on him. I just hit the gate on now. Can you hear me now? <coughs> Can you hear me now? Check, check, check. Oh, there we go. Okay. So. Yeah, it's kind of a new microphone, and apparently the on-off switch goes the other direction from the old one. Well, let's see if I can get it back on. Okay. All right. I can do this. We'll put it in the front. There we go. All right. <coughs> Edit all that out, guys. So where were we? 
poor Scottish farmer, his name was Fleming. One day, while he was uh, trying to make a living for his family, he heard cries for help, and uh, there was a, a nearby boy just over the hillside. He went over, and he had, it was kind of, you know, Scottish moors and stuff, and, and this kid had sunk to his waist in just slime and ooze and muck and mud, and, and he was fighting hard to get out, but he couldn't get out, and he was just fighting himself deeper in. And, and so this farmer said, well, I need to do something. I need to step in. And so he helped get this boy out of the muck and really saved him from a, a slow and uncomfortable death. And um, the next day, the nearby Lord uh, came. Not the Lord, but an English Lord came by, and it was his son that had been saved. And he said, I want, to, I want to give something to you. I want to do something for you for saving the life of my son. And so Mr. Fleming said, no, I, I, I couldn't possibly take anything from you for doing that. That was just the right thing to do. And just at that time, Farmer Fleming's son kind of came up behind him in the house. And, and the Lord kind of saw in from his carriage. And, and he said, I see your son there. He goes, let me do this for you. Let me take him and give him a proper education so that he can grow up to be, knowing that you're his father, he can grow up to be the kind of man that you'll be proud of. And so the farmer let him do that. And uh, indeed, the, the boy did grow up to be that kind of man. He graduated from St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London and went on to become known throughout the world as noted Sir Alexander Fleming, the inventor of penicillin. I should say the discoverer. God invented it. The discoverer of penicillin. And uh, interestingly enough, the boy, the Lord's, the, the, the boy who had been saved initially, came down with pneumonia years later, and his life was saved by the penicillin discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming. The name of that Lord was Lord Randolph Churchill. His son was named Winston. <laughs> Heard of him? Who ended up kind of saving his country from invasion in World War II. They say what comes around goes around. The kindness you give, the, the going out of your way that you give, comes back around. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning as we get near the end of the book of Galatians. This idea of this principle of sowing and reaping. It's like a law. You've got the law of gravity. If I step off the edge of this, I'm going to fall. Or I'm going to hover in the air and you guys are going to be like, wow, coolest church ever. But, <laughs> but I wouldn't bet on that one. Because I'm thinking the Lord would tell me if he was going to do that. But, and he never has. But you've got the law of gravity. You've got certain laws in life that we just know, inviolable laws, and the law of reaping and sowing is one of those. If you reap apples, you sow apples. That's backwards, isn't it? If you sow apples, <coughs> though it's still true, because if you reap the apples, then the seeds are in the apples. and It's a cycle, really. But, uh, but that principle is really, I, I believe, what Paul's getting into in this passage. And the first thing I want to do, though, is oftentimes, in fact, many, you know, when I'm preparing... You know, I go trolling other people's sermons to find good illustrations, like that last one. And, uh, and what I found is a lot of sermons from this section of Scripture about how you ought to pay your pastor enough. <laughs> I'm not lying. And I can see why, because if you, you know, go to this passage. Where are we? Here we go. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived, God's not mocked, for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. And so there's a lot of sermons out there about, you know what? Make sure you take care of the guy who's doing the teaching. I'm not going that direction today. I got at least three reasons for that. First reason is, it's a little awkward. Really? I'm going to get up and say, okay, now let me talk to you for 45 minutes about how you ought to really pay me well. <laughs> Seems a little self-serving. That's the first reason I'm not going there. Second reason I'm not going there is I don't have to. You guys are a very generous church, not only financially, but like I was sick, you guys are calling, you guys are praying, people dropped off stuff. You 
do well taking care of me. Because I don't need to go there. But the third most important reason is exegetically, nice word there for you, exegetically means when I exegete, this is what happens. I open up the Bible and I try to find out what is the meaning of the scripture in there, as opposed to eisegete, which is when you kind of decide what you want it to mean and then find the verses to prove what you already want, decided you want to say. I don't preach like that. I don't decide what I want to say and then back it up with scripture. I go into the scripture and say, what does this scripture actually say? And this passage has much more to say than like, I mean, do we really think the book of Galatians, this argument about not going into a place of legalism or license, but living into Christian liberty, living by the spirit, that Paul makes this argument through all five chapters, and then he gets into chapter six and he goes, but on the other hand, make sure you pay pastors well. Do we really think that's what's going on there? And, and when you actually look at the passage and you get into uh, some of the verbs, for instance, the verb when it gets into share all good things, it really means share all good things. The verb that's most often used for financially sharing throughout the New Testament is not used here. There's a word argos that's used, and it really means share all good things, and there's an emphasis on the spiritual. There's an idea of spiritual sharing in this passage. So that's why... It's, it's about more than money. And it's about more than pastors. And, uh, and so I want to kind of back up to the beginning of chapter 6, if we can. To kind of put, when you're exegeting a passage, you kind of got to look at the words they're actually saying. Thus, we look at this word Argos and go, that was not just a, a movie, but this is actually a word that has meaning. And Paul picked this word as opposed to another word. Why is that? And we look at things like that. But we also look at this passage in the context of the entire book of Galatians, and in the context of the entire chapter 6. And that's how we get a better understanding. Because I know it seems oftentimes when we're reading the Bible that suddenly the writer just kind of goes off on this weird tangent. And, and they're not that scattered. And so we kind of want to look at that. So let's go back to chapter 6, starting with verse 1. <laughs> Brothers, if anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And we, I'm not going to re-preach all of this, but I do want to kind of remind you that what we looked at is this idea of what Paul's teaching about the life in the spirit, the life of liberty as opposed to life of license or the license, life of legalism. And he's saying this is a life that's not just an individual thing. It's about community. It's about how the church is supposed to function. And then he brings it in, and we talked about this. And if you missed it, you can go to our website, I think that one's on there, either in video or audio form, and you can re-listen to that sermon if you want. But um, what he's really talking about here, he's going into how does this look in the life of the church? And in this passage, he's really talking about the guys who are stumbling, the people who are veering off to legalism, but the people who are veering off to license. You know, what do we do with them? He's going, you who are spiritual, now he's not setting aside a special class. He's not saying, okay, elders. Because if he's saying elders, he would say, Okay, elders, he says, you are spiritual. Now, he just spent five chapters of Galatians talking about how we're all called to live in the spirit. So if we're all called to live in the spirit, and he says, you who are spiritual, who's he talking to? Right, all of us. All of us are called in some way to speak into and invest in the lives of those other believers in the household of faith who are perhaps not as far along with us, or perhaps have fallen or stumbled or tripped. And so he's kind of looking at it from that, that thing. And then he goes on and says, um, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And he's talking now at this point to some of these leaders, particularly these leaders that have been kind of getting into the whole legalism thing and, and kind of comparing themselves. And he's saying, don't compare yourselves to each other. Compare yourselves to Jesus. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not his neighbor, for each one will have to bear his own load. And again, I won't re-preach the whole passage. But I just want you to see that in this chapter, he's been talking about, throughout the book, about living in liberty, living in the spirit, what it really looks like, not to just kind of be religious, but to live in this relationship with God and how that impacts how we function as a community. And then he goes into the beginning of chapter 6 and he says, so you guys who are spiritual, um, 
Make, you got to be taking care of each other, particularly those who are struggling, particularly those who are weak, so to speak. And then he gets to the passage we're looking at. Now he's going to turn. So it's kind of like he's been talking to this one group in the church, and now he turns and talks to the other group. He says, all right, so once we got you guys bearing one another's burdens, and once we got those of you who are maybe a little further along, we're trying to invest in each other and taking care of the weaker brother and restoring them and all these things. Now let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. So say, there's, there's a, again, there's a bearing one another's burdens. It's not like there's some of us in the church who are givers and there's some of our takers. We're all called to be givers, and we're all called to be takers, and we're all called to minister to one another and honor one another in different ways. And when this talks about let the one who's taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches, it's, it's, if we just say it's about you paying me, we have really missed the boat. Because first of all, am I the only one that teaches in this church? No way. I'm right, Rosaire, stand up. We got Pastor Rosaire. He does teaching in this church. Elders, stand up. We've got elders that do teaching in this church. Sunday school teachers, stand up, please. No, stay up, stay up, stay, 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 stay. Sunday school teachers, stand up. Youth leaders, stand up. Small group leaders, Sandy, stand up. Now, if you're not one now, but you have been one in the last five years, you're just taking some time off right now. Stand up. If you've done teaching in this church, Please stand up. These people are what this is talking about. And what we're, this passage is not talking about that we ought to pay all of them. Although, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> what, okay, you can sit down now. What it's talking about is honoring them. These people have given above and beyond to invest into your lives. And you ought to honor them. And share all good things, spiritual things with them. What does that mean? You need to share with them what God's doing in your life. You know, that, that, that's the most encouraging thing. You know, payday for me is not when the check comes. Payday for me is like when I get a message on Facebook from my friend Dylan, who was one of my youth when I was a youth pastor. He's a pastor now. And he tells me how well his church is doing. That's payday. Right? Youth leaders, when you see your kids, you know, any of you leaders... When someone comes up to you and says, I just want you to know, when, when you preach that message that Sunday, Tom was coughing his lungs out, <laughs> that it impacted me in this way. So one of the ways we honor them is to encourage them. Let them know how they have touched your life. They need to hear that. Because a lot of times, if they're anything like me, there's moments where they go, was that worth it? Did I actually accomplish anything? Right? Leaders, anyone ever feel that way? You're going, I'm just spinning my wheels here. You are making a difference. So we honor them by encouraging them. We honor them by praying for them. Pray for them. If you're a leader, if you're positively impacting the rest of the church, you have a big bullseye on your forehead. The enemy wants to neutralize you. He will discourage you. He will trip you up. He will entice you. He will tempt you. Or he'll, he'll hang back and he'll let you get really influential and kind of spiritually lazy. And just when you can do the most damage, pow, that's when he'll hit. Sorry, now, now we're back down to one teacher. <laughs> it's like, I'm out, I'm out. Don't let that scare you because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. But be praying for these leaders. Be encouraging these leaders. And even though they're not on the payroll, you know, a gift card to Panera, whatever. You know, we try to, you know, once a year, our Sunday school teachers, we try to get them a gift as a church. And that's cool, you know. People like, like when you're sick, you like getting an, a, a little card from the, the pastor and staff of the church, right? But let's admit it. When just some other person from the church who doesn't have to send you a card sends a card, doesn't that mean a little bit more? Right? So the fact that we as a staff, get them a gift to encourage them. That's meaningful, but it's not nearly as meaningful as the things you can do to speak into their lives. 
That's what this passage is talking about. It's not just paying pastors. It's like there's people in our church who are investing in you. Invest back into them. And it doesn't have to be anything big. It could be the smallest thing. It could be, you know, going on their Facebook page and say, I really appreciate the stuff you do at church. You've impacted my life. That's the stuff. So that's a big part of what it talks about. Reaping and sowing. He's saying leaders who have invested into lives sow back into their life somehow. Because when you sow back into, your, into their lives, you will reap much more back. But that's just part of it. He goes on to say, do not deceive. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. And now what we're getting into is the entirety of Galatians. Because remember, Galatians talking about you don't want to go in the direction of liberty where you can just presume on God's grace and do whatever you want. You don't want to go in the, the direction of license. Uh, no, I'm messing it all up. License, where you can do what you want and presume on God's grace. Or in the area of legalism, where it's all about checking boxes and doing the you know, obeying the right rules, and now God owes me in some way. He's saying, if you're going to sow, if you're going to live your Christian life in a way that presumes upon God's grace, you're going to reap the fruit of that kind of life. If you're going to sow in the area of legalism, where it's all about, so I've done all the right things, God owes me, you're, you're going to reap the fruit of that kind of life. He's saying, don't do that. Sow in the direction of liberty. So in the direction of grace. So in the direction of living a life empowered by the Holy Spirit in relationship with God. And the fruit that will be reaped will be a bountiful harvest. He's saying that this is kind of like a summary of the whole book of, of Galatians. God is not mocked. There's kind of some principles here. What you reap, what you sow, you will reap. I'll get it the right direction sooner or later. Did I mention them on the occasion? No. Anyway. <laughs> See, today it'll just be like, it's okay, Pastor. We got what you're trying to say. <laughs> I'll be encouraged, you know, just that I didn't confuse you today. Anyway, so uh, we, we've got this idea that, that what you sow, you will reap. But there's some other principles here. God is not mocked. God knows what you sow. You can fool me. You can fool the other people in your row of chairs. You can fool the entire church. But you can't fool God. God will not be mocked. And what that's saying, it's not saying like, he's not saying don't tease God. I think that's a bad idea anyway. But that's not what he's saying here. He's not saying, nah, 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 God, you know, I'm making fun of you. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying God will not be mocked. He's saying God has, has, has laid down a a very clear path on how we're to live if we think we can do what we want and get away with it and make a mockery of the cross because that's what both li uh, legalism and license both really make a mockery of the cross right because if I'm going to just do whatever I want because God's going to forgive me anyway then that, that doesn't value the blood of Christ does it and we think well, God has to do this, that, the other thing, because I did all the right things. That also makes a mockery of the cross. Do not be fooled. God will not be mocked. For whatever one sows, he will also reap. For the ones who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Again, this is this idea of live into everything I've been saying in chapter 1 through 5 in Galatians. Live into this life in the spirit. And what you will sow is a spirit. What you sow and what you reap will be a spiritual harvest. But if you sow to the flesh, and th again, the flesh, what he's been talking about in this entire book of the Bible, when he's talking about the flesh, he said, doing things in your own power as opposed to doing things in God's power. If you go and you live the Christian life in your own power, what it's saying here is that you will reap corruption. Well, that kind of stinks. Wait, you're saying I can live the Christian life and reap corruption? Yeah, have you ever watched TV? 
That's all the time all over the place. If you're doing this thing under your own power, then you're falling into this whole legalism thing. You're falling into playing this game with God. Or if I do the right things, then you, God, have to do This is a deal. This is a bargain. And God's saying, it's no deal. There's no negotiation here. There's nothing you can do that I need. Is this newsflash? You, God, doesn't need you? Because he's all-powerful. What do you really think you bring to the game to add to that? The only thing you bring to the game to add to that is you bring yourself, a person who he loves dearly and died on the cross to save. So he wants you. He wants who you are. He wants your life. He wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want anything else. And so when we try to do things in our own strength in order to kind of hedge our bets in heaven, we reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. It's when we just say, God, I need your help. God, I need your power. And through obedience and submission, we allow him to work in and through our lives in powerful ways. And he talks now to all of us, I think, the, to people investing in one another, both both into strength and into weakness. He says, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Don't give up. Anyone here ever feel like a little frustrated? Maybe, maybe you're a youth leader. Maybe you're a Sunday school teacher. Maybe you're an elder. And you're like, man, I'm working hard, but what's going on? I'm, I'm a little tired of this. It seems like people really just don't give a rip. Or, or maybe, you, maybe you haven't been a teacher. Maybe you're just going, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to love the people i got to work with. And you're loving on them. And you're sowing. And it seems like all you get back from them is junk. What? That's a law of reaping and sowing here. I'm sowing love into their lives. Why aren't they loving me back? What's going on here? I'm going to love them one more time. And if they don't love me back this time, we're going a different route. They better get to know Jesus then. Because you're going to meet him soon. Right? Paul's saying this, this whole thing, reaping and sowing, sowing, so it's not instantaneously. It's not, you know, press the button, get the photocopy out. It's, you know, we, it, we, we serve a crockpot God, but we're in a microwave world. Right? We want to just put it in. One, comes out hot. You ever notice the stuff in the microwave doesn't stay hot as long as the stuff you cooked on a stove? Interesting. We can beat this metaphor for hours. <laughs> but <coughs> the law of sowing and reaping is not a microwave law. It's a crockpot law. Sometimes your reaping happens there. Sometimes your reaping happens here. But God promises us in this passage, your reaping will happen. You will reap what you sow. And this is the answer. This, this crockpot idea is the answer when we say, I don't get it. Why is it that I turn on the TV and I see these people living these immoral lives and they seem like they just get blessed? You know, this, this question is in the Bible. I think later on this year we're going to look at Habakkuk. Habakkuk gets into that. What's going on? Why is it that the, the evil seem to be blessed and the good seem to be punished? What's going on? It's because it's not a microwave deal. It's a crockpot deal. But God will not be mocked. In the short term, things may look upside down. But in the long term, what you sow, you will reap. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Love on everyone, but especially family. In fact, when we love on the people outside the family, mostly we're living on them because we want to bring them inside the family. But, but this is what we're called to. This is the life of the Spirit. The life of the Spirit isn't just read your Bible every day, pray every day, and ignore the rest of the world because it's just you and Jesus. We're called into a life in the church, the called out ones. We're called into a life in the church that is meant to be family.
We are called to be a family on mission. And it's through life in the spirit that that happens. It's not through legalism, not through license. So what about you? I want to finish with this, this idea of sowing and reaping. Francis of Assisi, you may have heard this prayer that he wrote. And I want you to just kind of reflect on it and then, and then take some time to ponder, God, what are you saying to me? What's my loving Heavenly Father saying to me about reaping, about sowing, about loving, about living on, in a family on mission, about how I need to be investing in these people who are sitting all around me in this room, maybe even that crazy guy on the stage. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Let's bow our heads and just let, allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your heart this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you. We are so grateful that, uh, that you give to us liberally, that you give to us graciously, that you don't give as we deserve, even though we keep trying to somehow earn your favor, Lord, that it's, it's not something that's earned. It's something that you freely give. And because you've freely given to us, Lord, we pray that you would enable us to freely give to one another. To, to bless one another with all good things. Words and deeds. Help us, Lord, to bless one another. Lord, I pray that this, this place would never be a place that we come out of duty. We come because we love our family. And we love our Father. And when we come here, we get to be with both. And that's a blessing. So, Lord, I pray that your spirit be working in our lives so that when we do show up, we are blessed and we bless. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.